I hip shot it from right here, and it died. You know, I can't. So it has to be right there. Hey, there's, hey, there's still, there's still, there's still, there's still coming in. Over top of this tree. Kill him. I didn't pull the trigger. I was about. I was about. I was here, and the first one went. I was like, nope, we're good. I was about four foot above that one, so. Oh, hey, hey, here we got another one coming in. Dog out, dog out, dog out. Welcome to the Foul Front Outdoors Tales and Tips segment, where we bring to light the heart of hunting through shared experiences and lessons learned. By talking with real hunters, both new and old, to preserve and share part of this passion that we hold dear, not only to entertain, but also to educate. So listen up, because this is Tales and Tips, and you're on the Foul Front. Today we're out here on the Nebraska Teal Opener with Josh from All Bowed Up. And uh, we got some birds down on the ground so yeah. far, so... I think we're uh, upwards of closer to 20 of our 36 bird limit for six guys. Yeah. Now, how long you been guiding, Josh? This will be my four fifth season at it. Um, so, it's I mean, it's a work in progress, obviously, but each year we're growing, so... Yeah. That's the right direction to go in, I'd say. Now, primarily, you guys... You said you run and gun geese? Run and gun geese. That's our, you know, we don't sell any duck hunts or anything like that. Yeah. Um, just, you know, Lincoln just doesn't hold the numbers of ducks to yeah. be able to go out and sell someone a duck hunt. But big honkers is our game. Well, I don't know if I believe you about that duck thing right now. Uh, <laughs> You're putting us on quite a few blue wings here. Yeah, I mean, teal, you know, you got two good weeks of teal hunting, but... That's that. We don't really get the brown ducks or the mallards. There's no real water around Lincoln. Yeah. Per se. Is this a group coming over here? Is that doves? No, those are doves. Yeah. Well, so how long have you been hunting? Um, I think I shot my first duck when I was five or six, and I've been hooked ever since. Yeah. So, 20 years. All primarily here around Lincoln? Uh, I grew up hunting in the northeast part of the state, the Tecama area. Okay. Um, there's a bunch of, probably 30 clubs in a 10-mile radius up there. I wonder they're dead, right? Yeah. yeah. So that's, you know, I'd call myself a pit baby until about December. <laughs> <laughs> hey, there's a group of teal right there. Oh, yeah. Well, this is just about like dove hunting almost. Yeah, yeah. Sit, sit in the weeds. Yeah, to paint you a picture here, we are sitting over a sloppy, sloppy uh, water little water hole with some, is that, was it smart weed or? Uh, three square, I think. Three square. And, uh, oh. Hey, the fastest duck in the world. <laughs> Dang it. Well, paint you a picture on that one. Uh, <laughs> Mitch Jones is out here with us from Twisted Wire, and apparently he can only shoot pheasants. So I hit that one; it died. <laughs> we had a we had quite a few groups coming in this morning. A little slow start. It was pretty dark with the cloud cover. Yeah. 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 I, yeah, I thought it would be a little too early. For, to get any good numbers of teal. Yeah, I've like I was talking earlier, we're we're a week early technically. You know, usually it's the weekend after dove season. Yeah. I wonder what drove them to make that decision. You just know? first weekend of September, I believe. Yeah. So, but that cold front in the middle of this week helped us a lot. Yeah. Moved in some numbers of birds. Absolutely. Yeah, I didn't see when we were driving up here. 
I was checking out all the, the ponds between Manhattan and here, and I didn't start seeing any any dots on the water until we got to, oh, what is that, Cortland? Cortland, yeah. yeah. But after that, I was seeing quite a few, actually. There must just be a fine line. They didn't have to go any further. I didn't know. Did it get cold in Kansas? Like yeah, it did. Right, it did get right, cold right, in Kansas. To the right, to the right. Single. enough away from the decoys it shouldn't matter well and we got what one two three four five five mojos out there yeah that well, sir that higdon pulsator that thing's pretty nice yeah that was that single that just flew by <laughs> <laughs> hopefully they're better shots than we are yeah, <laughs> it sounds like either these guys are done or they're just not seeing any more birds, but they probably shot a case of peas yeah. to the east of us there. Yeah, you know that's how teal works. So. Oh, hey, one coming in low. One coming in low. Kill it. Finally got one, guys. <laughs> that's coming in my pile. Got a... Uh, you got one teal decoy and a mojo with that one, I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that mojo is sold, so. <laughs> <laughs> so. If you guys want the 12 decoys on the left, shoot them and sink them so I don't carry them out. <laughs> well, I was just thinking that, too, after going out there into that. Out into this thing's soggy. Yeah. It's about two inches of water and two foot of mud. <laughs> she likes to carry them by the band. I was going to say, there's a, she's about 15 yards from the other one that's laying dead. Oh, is that one right out there? It's yeah, yeah, dead. That's dead. one we shot earlier. Yeah, it's tough going getting these birds out here out, out in that uh, on these marshes. But Josh is doing the right thing when we got birds that go down or sailing and whatnot. Those go those go towards the bag limit in case any new listeners are trying to you know figure out how you deal with that and then. We gotta, you know, hunt till we get to our number, We're counting the birds that have, you know, sailed, you know, down about 40 or 50 yards, and then you go collect those, and if you don't come up with uh, a full man limit, well... In possession, yeah. Yep. But you still shot your limit. <laughs> yep. Even yeah. if you can't find them, so yep. let's count towards your limit. Mike, you gonna send her after that other one? Yeah, I will. Yeah. And that's, that's one other thing about teal hunting that I was listening to. Do uh, you listen to the Big Honker podcast? Mm-mm. Uh, okay. Single coming in. They were, oh, yeah, out front. <laughs> they are talking about how teal season can be real rough on dogs. Oh, I mean, this mud, just watching this dog go through the mud is, I feel her pain. She probably won't get off the couch for the next week. Yeah. I actually just got in with a guy. His name's Evan. Um, oh, yeah. Hi, Paul Evan. Evan Oswald? Yeah. Yeah. Gypsum Creek yep, Retrievers. Gypsum Creek Retrievers, yeah. And, uh... I, follow, I followed Matt McLeathan from down that area. Okay, yeah. He's friends with Evan for a, a long time. Yeah. Evan's a really nice guy. We we sat and chatted on the phone for about an hour the other night. He was telling me all about the way that he trains dogs, and I I really want to go check that out. And the next, the next dog I get, I'll probably have him. I got three right now, though. About a half a duck dog between a lot of them. <laughs> but I don't have a dog. Just my hunts with me, and I don't like hunting with two dogs, especially late season. There's no need for two dogs in a field. Yeah. So once she gets a little bit older, I'm gonna purchase a dog. Give me some time to find a good one. Get it with a good trainer. Yeah. Well, that that Evan he was telling me that he's he kind of goes he's got. A different approach to how he trains them, and he can basically take tough trained dogs and turn them out pretty well. Hmm. He does. He seems like he's got a crap load of dogs, a lot of business. Yeah, he was just grown. He's, you know, I mean, enough for him to be able to do it full time. Yeah, I give anybody credit to train can, dogs full time. Yeah, and if you can, if you can turn a passion like uh, you know hunting or training dogs 
into something that you don't have to split between a full-time job. Right. One, you're a very brave soul. And two, like, that's, that's a lot of, that's a lot of work. Yeah. I mean, you gotta just the patience to work with them dogs every day, you know. Yeah. I don't know exactly how many dogs he has, but I'd guess he spends, you know, 30 minutes a day with each dog at least. Oh, yeah. That's a lot of commitment. Probably you know, more than that, honestly. You know, you can't call him sick doing that. No. Oh. <laughs> I'll take one of those. I'll celebrate. Yeah, and we, we always donate a bunch of hunts to uh, um, like Central City, uh, 4-H. We always donate a hunt for them to auction. Oh, we got the, the tweeter birds are flying good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this little local WMA. It was a kind of a war zone this morning. <laughs> oh, yeah. Some of them guys sound pretty crazy out there. We do pleasant quail and tracker. You do. The yep. ammo companies, if you're an ammo executive, we're, we're you'd have liked to have heard what was going on this morning. Yeah. There's no limit. If it flies, it dies. Yeah. It's, so it's easier for kids to come out. You don't. So have did you throw any of them decoys stuff. with duck nuts out there? Have you, uh, just that. Shoot, well, I mean, when we do have one, one yeah, just the pulsator. Has that duck nut on it? Yeah. I, I, those things are pretty, yeah. seem pretty cool. Yeah, I, I guess I didn't know how they slid, but that's... Must, I don't know how that works. I'd have to look at it more. Yeah, my thing with decoy rigging is that I like to just throw my <laughs> into a bag or a box. And, uh, you, know, you know, when you're doing Texas rigs, that's kind of hard. Yeah. Next time you take those things out. Oh, I'm good. But, uh. It's tradition in the all built up. When do you do We smoke camel crushes like cigars because you can't afford cigars. Damn, I almost, I almost, I almost bought a box of cigars last cigars. night to bring. I was like, I can. Do you care if I smoke this by you? Please, go ahead. We're getting going. I'm honestly, guys, I think I'm them European hunts that he sells. Well, see, that's what we started doing last year is yeah. European hunts. Is it talking about those tower hunts? Yeah. You but that shoot a lot of birds. That's that. You go through two hundred birds in an hour and a half. Yeah. I love the pigeons. <laughs> About well, that's like about shooting. the only way you can shoot a dang pheasant yeah, in, in Nebraska. Nebraska. <laughs> yeah, you gotta have those. We tried to do it with Chucker. We, we did it I know some Chucker people Chucker do pen raised ducks them. too. Just, uh, I just uh, seen something about that on Facebook. There's a lot of people that are bashing. I'm like, how do you? I, to me, it seems a little, little strange. But I mean, if there's a market for it, sure. Yeah. Only I problem, know. only problem I get is, is like when you like create content off that. Like, oh, we slam the yeah. mallards today. Selling book hunts off of. Yeah. Pin <laughs> raised ducks. I'm going to run somebody anything. You're going to run this. What time is it? Like 7.40. 7.40. Okay. I need it's so early. I got some coffee in my blind bag if, if you need it. I swear to God if I can have Yeah. I mean, we did a lot of shooting today. Bring us all back something to drink. Oh. <laughs> oh. Wow. You're going to walk all the way back to the truck. <laughs> We're walking all the way back. I'll buy. Just make sure. you, guys, you guys don't have one of them. Let me uh, see that hat. What are the little six wheeled Argos? Yeah. So you can just uh, roll I, wish. I just actually seen two two for sale on yeah, the Facebook key, Marketplace. The the what do you need, Kobe? Speaking of big red hunters, who's that? that hunter? Justin, I believe. Justin Pike. Oh, and hey, I got some toe tags. I mean, oh, yeah, we could take it. pictures. I need to get a hold of him. Uh, so I, I brought some for you, too. Oh, okay, sweet. So them duck nuts, do they uh, four, six, and eight ounce? They, yeah. Um, he's got fours, sixes, eights, and then you can get the different lines, lengths as well. Here comes a good group. I hear him. Oh, that's a that's a hunter. Oh, you think? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's the. My real, mouth is numb. 
<laughs> oh, will you get? So, what's everybody wants to drink? I'll just take water. Fucking water. Water. Are you guys gonna want to pack up and leave then, or do you want me to go with him so you don't have to pack up? I don't. It doesn't matter. We could. We when could did, yeah. When did we say we were gonna pack? Eight forty-five. So another I, hour. That's. I'm good with okay. rolling yeah. on too. With the amount of shooting we've had. Yeah. You know. So is that satisfactory for you? Or? This week's episode is brought to you by the following partners: Hunt Hickory Creek. And new to Hunt Hickory Creek this year is their Central Kansas Lodge. Now, they run hunters from the end of October all the way through January, and they're situated right between Kavira and Cheyenne Bottoms, which combined can hold hundreds of thousands of birds at a time. Now, these guys work their tails off to not only put you on birds, but to show you a great time. So don't take your chance on something shady or unknown. Come check out Chase and a few of his guides, Cody and Scotty, in our Facebook group and pick their brains. And if you're going to hunt Kansas, hunt Hickory Creek. We're also brought to you by Dive Bomb Industries, the fastest growing, most affordable decoys on the market. With unmatched customer service, you can find them on Facebook, Instagram, or divebombindustries.com. You can also find Asher in our listeners group, and you can use the code FOULFRONT to get your 10% off and get yourself into a large, effective, and affordable, and easy to set up spread. It takes about a minute to set out a dozen. They take up no space in the garage or truck. So go get yourself twice the decoys with half the price and none of the hassle at Dive Bomb Industries. Now, with dove season approaching us and teal season, remember that they too are migratory game birds. Federal laws apply in all 50 states, and that includes gifting and tagging laws. Make sure to keep your birds separated and or tagged when transporting or storing them with other hunters' birds. This includes from field to home as well. Gifting in the field, although commonly done, is never legal under 50 CFR 2040, and it must be done at the donor or donee's personal abode. For other helpful hints and tips, check them out on Facebook or under Toe Tags LLC on their website at toetagsllc.com. Have fun, be safe, and keep it legal. We're also brought to you by Athlon Optics, which produces some of the finest shooting scopes and binoculars on the market. Their ED glass is top-notch and rivals the glass of binos three or four times their price. You'll be able to pick a goose out in a depression from half a mile away with these things. They're tough, sturdy, and then this is where Athlon Optics goes above and beyond with a lifetime warranty. This thing is, which is pretty critical for a waterfowl hunter, so head on over to Athlon Optics and get a top-of-the-line binocular system for the season at a fraction of the price and a no-worries guarantee. FreelanceHuntStats.com. I have to tell you, I'm really excited to start uh, using the Freelance Hunt Stats system this year. So if you've never logged your hunts in the past, or I think it's something that you should really start doing this season, on FreelanceHuntStats.com. Not only can you look back and remember past hunts, but you can also use it to help you learn and improve with your future hunting successes. So don't forget to set up your account and start logging uh, this season. We're also brought to you by Duck Nuts. That's D-U-K-N-U-T-Z. Now, I've been fighting decoy rigging systems since I started. Wrapping, coiling, even Texas rigs. Talk about a pain in the butt. Now, I work hard, but at the end of the morning, it's time to go home. And Duck Nuts allows you to rig your decoys uh, so that all you got to do is throw them in the bag. And with their friction system, it's too easy to just pull the line and pack up or throw them out. It also allows you to adjust for depth. So if you're tired of fighting decoy rigs, head on over to ducknuts.com and use your 10% off foul front discount code. Also brought to you by Gypsum Creek Retrievers, which is a full-service gun dog training facility in the heart of the Midwest. And they look to build eager, confident, and reliable field companions through a unique approach that you won't find at many other places. So go check out Gypsum Creek Retrievers on Facebook or Instagram, or you can hit up Evan, the owner in our Facebook group. We're also brought to you by DuckTech. Increase your odds of success in the blind this year with the DuckTech mobile app. Three-time world champion duck caller Barney Califf teaches you how to make the most important sounds, what they mean to a duck, and when to use them. DuckTech is available to download in the App Store and Google Play. So with the season approaching, get the app today so you can put more ducks on the strap tomorrow. And uh, we're also brought to you by SRB Field Rests. No matter what where or how you hunt, SRB Field Rest will keep your shotgun, rifle, bow, or crossbow clean, safe, and ready in the field or on the range. Waterfowl hunters in the dry or muddy fields. Turkey or predator hunters in the pop-up blinds. Hey, if you're hunting deer, elk, or bear, or any other big game, uh, hunting in box blinds, they've got you covered. They even have rests for bow fishermen. So head on over to srbfieldrests.com and use your foul front discount code to get 10% off. Okay, let's get back into the show. But before we do, I just want to tell you guys, use these companies. Uh, these people are bringing you the, um, the foul front podcast and 
It's not just because they cut us a check. Uh, we have a lot of people out there that want to support the show, and these are the ones that we choose. These Behind all these companies are great people, really fun people to work with, and um, I hope you get to know them just as well as I do. And these products are great. So when in doubt, choose one of these companies, and we appreciate you supporting the people that are bringing you this show. All right, let's get back into the episode. All right, today we've got Kevin Weir. Uh, Kevin, you want to say hi? Hi, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> now, Kevin, uh, you're, you're out in the field right now, aren't you? Yes, I am. I'm up on the Olympic Peninsula chasing a 500-pound black bear that I've been seeing. Yeah. Uh, what do you, you call him the beast, right? I do. And uh, when, he, when you find his toy out in the woods, which is an old tire that he throws around and plays with, you, you know, he's not a small individual. Yeah, yeah, correct, correct. So uh, how long have you been, been hunting this guy? I saw him uh, the middle of summer, middle of July, about two weeks before our season opened in August, August 1st. And he, he literally walked across the trail right in front of me. Uh, I saw his tracks and sign last year during deer, deer season. And I've pretty much been trying to narrow down his core range ever since. And I think I've pretty much got it narrowed down. Uh, and then when he walked across the trail, bingo, I knew this is the area right here. Awesome. Awesome. So, um, <clears throat> you, you've got bear out there up in the, in the, you know, the P- the Pacific Northwest, but you and me were talking the other night and you were telling me a little bit of something about, uh, something else you, you kind of chase out there. What is that? <laughs> well, if you want to, want to believe me and go with it, some people call it Sasquatch. Some people call it Bigfoot. <laughs> I had to bring it up. I'm sorry. That's okay. That's all right, man. But uh, you you say you've had some encounters with him, right? Well, never eye to eye. Um, in the 90s, I found a nest of one, which uh, people say, well, it may have been something else, but I, I don't know of any animal that forms a, a soup bowl out of dirt and dust and lays down in it and uh, drops scat inside the bed as well as outside and all around it and then comes back at various times during the year and uses the same spot to hide in. So I'm pretty confident, and uh, it's only a mile and a half from a farm where the farmer says he sees one on his property about every month and just a few miles as the crow flies from where Mr. Paul Freeman filmed a few Bigfoot and uh, cast a lot of footprints in the Blue Mountains. Well, awesome. I mean, that's obviously still up to date. There's a lot more scouting that needs to go into the old Bigfoot, uh, you know, hunting. But um, I, I found that interesting. And I was telling you about that one time that I was out fishing up in the Boundary Waters, and I, I thought I saw something. But yeah, okay. <laughs> the uh, the mind can play tricks, but. Uh, I guess, I guess the, I guess I didn't have you on here to debate the uh, legitimacy of <laughs> Yetis or Sasquatch or anything of that that nature. So I suppose we ought to get into the meat of why uh, got us you and me talking. Yeah, we can we can do the uh, former anytime, but <laughs> we'll come back and we'll do a whole we'll do a whole. Uh, actually, uh, I'm going to kind of preview this um, for the halloween week i'm gonna have basically scary stories um a field so maybe uh we can talk a little bit about hunting sasquatch during uh around halloween (laughs) i'll I'll try to come up with a whopper okay sounds good (laughs) all right but uh kevin go ahead and tell us a little bit about your uh what you got going on well in in the uh about seven years ago i had a vision of what a, a client of mine once told me. I used to guide up in goose hunters on the Snake and Columbia River, and I helped out this gentleman two or three years who was a former Navy SEAL. And he was telling me that his favorite combat weapon was his 870 duck gun that he had shipped over, and he took a mallet and beat the muzzle down to spread the pellets uh, laterally. And I just visioned a greenhead 
flying through a line of pellets, ducking and dodging, and started drawing and coming up with notes and took it from there. And, and I've developed a choke tube, but of course everybody now is using uh, screw-in tubes. Uh, so my tubes can, you know, you screw them in and, and you can replicate this pattern vertically, horizontally, diagonally. Uh, at say at 25 yards, you can get a 25 to 30 inch wide pattern that's only 10, 12 inches in depth. And so, that's virtually with any size pellets. So what's, uh, you sent me some pictures. Um, so if, you know, number four or number two shot coming out of there, um, what what could be my you know at, at thirty five or forty yards? Let's just call it forty yards. At forty yards, what kind of spread could I have laterally? Laterally, probably forty forty five inches. Wow. And, well, I guess it, I shouldn't even say laterally because you said you can adjust it, right? Yes, I, I sold a few to a, a guide up in Alaska who has a spot he takes his clients to, and the birds come in at a 45-degree angle virtually every time they come in. So he wanted these tubes to turn into a, a, to a diagonal pattern to adjust to that dive that they're, the birds are using when they come in. Interesting. So uh, now have you – I mean, I, I'm, I'm assuming – do you have to do much uh, practice – with these tubes to get you know used to them practice uh good point yeah all the all the scribes all the outdoor writers will tell you pattern your shotgun find out what pellets what size loads at what ranges your gun shoots the best and i'll be the first to admit these tubes don't pattern every shell the same way you have to shoot a few different ones and and see which one your gun with this choke really wants to use uh i've traditionally used number three shot over decoys and uh most of the steel shot three inch loads will pattern very well with it uh it seems like the bigger the pellet the better the pattern okay number, number twos pattern very well with most steel loads uh number six lead patterns very well with with most loads but again, you have to have to try different loads and see which comes out better. So, please tell me about uh, a little bit about the the R and D that went into this. So, okay, this client of yours is telling you about this, and you, you know, the the wheels start turning in your mind, and then what happens from there? Tell me the story. Yeah, I, I was at work, and and I'm an RN, and I came out of a room that vision hit me and I, I stopped what I was doing and started drawing and and making notes and, and writing down ideas right there in the hallway my boss comes by and says Kevin what are you doing well boss I'm uh, I'm writing notes on this last patient that I saw okay <laughs> very good carry on <laughs> and I went back and forth with a machine shop with um standard tubes, replaceable tubes, trying to modify them, and it just wasn't coming out. So we had to start from scratch and build our own, literally. So we've been machining, trying different combinations over the last few years, and my partner and I have come up with something that uh, is just phenomenal uh, on targets like skeet, uh, vertical teal dropping on the sporting place course, uh, you know, anything that's in a straight line, uh, divers, upland birds, sea ducks, yeah, anything like that, these patterns are going to give you an extra foot of pattern because it's taking the pattern from the top and bottom where you're not going to be putting pellets on the bird anyway. Put those pellets back into the flight path. Yeah, I mean, that makes total sense. Um, because what what is your company motto? Birds don't fly in circles. <laughs> I like that. I, I I had to draw that out. Um, yeah. <laughs> no, but uh, so this is. Uh, is there anybody else out there really doing this? No, there. I I did a, a an extensive uh, patent search. There are none in the world anywhere being made like this uh, commercially. 
there were some back in the late 1800s, early 1900s that had the same thought process going into it. And, uh, and the military had what they called the duck bill. Uh, I don't know how popular that was during the war in Vietnam or if it ever left there. But as far as I know, mine's the only one in current production. And uh, certainly it's the only one that can be rotated and locked into various positions. Right, right. So what does it take to lock it into a different position? It, each tube has a lock ring on it. Okay. Um, you just basically screw that lock ring all the way onto the tube as far as it'll go, screw the tube into the barrel as far as it'll go, and then just back it up a quarter, half turn to the position you want and lock it down with that lock ring. Uh, there's no reason to back it up more than one turn because you know, you've got two sides to the uh, right. tube and, and you can rotate it into any position within one turn. Interesting, very interesting. So uh, when when did this idea start? About seven years ago. Seven years ago? Okay. And you've been running one ever since, pretty much. I, I, I use mine on my A70 for everything. Literally, that's what I'm using today out here bear hunting. A uh, three-inch load of double-off buckshot. But in these thickets, yeah, everybody says don't use buckshot on bike bear. But these thickets I'm in, a long shot is going to be 20 yards max. Yeah. And I figure I can take out a substantial amount of spinal column with this pattern. Well, why don't you tell me a little bit about the reactions that you have from people uh, when you either, one, tell them about your, your product, or, or two, take them out and, you know, because you're a diver hunter, correct? Dives and sea ducks, yes. Yeah, so, uh, you know, tell me a little bit about when, you know, people first see this thing and, you know, what are they, what are the reactions? Uh, I had it on my gun with out sea duck hunting last year, and one fellow that's in our ski club had heard us talking about it, but had never seen it in action. And I, I pulled up on a, a big white wing scoter and shot, and when he saw the pattern hit the water, oh my god! <laughs> Gosh, how could you with that? <laughs> uh, he was amazed, dumbfounded with the pattern. Yeah. Uh, most people, yeah, you know, it's such a radically new concept for shotgunning. Ever since the Chinese poured pea gravel down a pipe and set it off, you know, we've had round patterns right. literally for hundreds of years now. And so an oblong or, or oval pattern is something that people have a hard time wrapping their minds around. But when they see it in action, uh, quite often, they're amazed. They're simply amazed. Yeah, uh, I not when we get done here. I think, or when I post this, you should definitely uh, go to the the foul front group and uh, post some of your um, your patterns and some of your you know get some videos or something of uh, the the pattern hitting the water and stuff like that. Because I I'd, I'd be very curious to to see that as well. You've already sent me you know several pictures, but I'd like to definitely see. Um, the left and the right is, is an awesome thing, especially for you diver hunters, but I'm kind of thinking, I, correct me if I'm wrong here. I, I kind of, I think I would might maybe want mine, uh, up and down. Cause I usually have birds finishing and, you know, in my face or, and, or taken off. Um, you know? Oh yeah. Mallards and, and honkers settling into the decoys that you're for a shot. They're, they're sitting still. And so, yeah, it's like aiming a rifle at that point. But when they flare, they're coming straight up or slightly left and right. And in that vertical pattern, uh, you want, you shouldn't have to blot out the bird like you traditionally do with a, a round pattern. Right. Absolutely. And now tell me a little bit about this 45 degree angle thing that you were talking about, uh, with one of your, one of your clients. You know, I, he told me about that and, I'm kind of having a hard time wrapping my head around that also. <laughs> uh, I don't have any 45 degree targets. Um, <laughs> yeah. He, he does apparently and he feels like, uh, his clients are benefiting from it. So yeah, man, go for it. Yeah. Well, geez. Well, geez. So 
Okay, so what do we got to do? Um, I, I know you ran, you know, quite a bu- uh, quite a few of them. Um, how, you said you, how many have you produced? I've probably turned out a couple of hundred. Yeah. Uh, so far. we had we had to uh, back off production for a little while. We had a, a couple of events go on with the machine shop, and we're about to get started with another shop. Uh, my partner, Dustin Roberts, is going to be heading that up. Uh, so we're going to be, he and I will be selling off what our inventory is now. And then uh, as we get the shop up to speed, if guys want to do a pre-sale, we are, are more than happy to, to work with them. Most of the tubes we're going to be turning out are going to be for Remington and Mossberg. Okay. Simply because that's the two highest selling production shotguns out there right, right. They're, they're a good entry level point and they're good reliable guns yeah exactly so so where do you see this thing uh, in, in 10 or 15 years I see this almost to the point of uh, matching Carlton's and any of the other high end tubes. Uh, the sky's the limit with it. We've only got one design out there right now, and, and we intend to take it further and go with porting and, and extending it a little bit more, experiment with different combinations, and, and just really basically have fun. Yeah. Well, and that's the other thing, too. We, you and me were talking about it. I said, you know, I got to thinking this thing, and I'm just thinking it's it looks like a you know a baseball cap coming out of the end of my barrel. But uh, you said it only extends what an inch off of the end of the barrel. Right. It, it's the most right now. Our current model comes out an inch. Uh, we will probably take that out a little bit farther. Maybe add some porting to it. Um, experiment with pulling the water away from the shot pattern as it exits. Yep. Different things like that. Um, you know, we're not going to sit on our hind end and see how it goes. We're going to be proactive and go forward. Right, right. Well, awesome. Um, so why don't we tell a little bit about um, what kind of, you know, you have an interesting hunting story, I think, um, or a, a story a, or a career in hunting, as it were. Um, why don't you tell the listeners a little bit about uh, how you got involved in in duck hunting or hunting in general and uh where it's taken you well i i started off in early 1970s um most people start off with the uncle or their father or grandfather it was my grandmother that got me started hunting and uh believe it or not i sit on the hood of her buick Lasalle with my recurve and <laughs> we'd bow hunt up and down the road <laughs> on her first <laughs> Oh, and yeah, that was, that was pretty interesting. But she taught me a lot, and it went. For, and in high school, I, in the mid seventies, I got in with a couple of the guys, and we started hitting the swamps and stuff around North Louisiana. Okay, so when did you get into the ducks? Oh, uh, probably nineteen seventy four, seventy five. Uh, started hunting in. in uh, Darbone Bottom, Starbone Bayou, Darbone Swamp, north of Monroe, Louisiana. And, so right, um, in the, right in the heart of uh, the, right, duck, yeah, duck, the duck capital of the world, as it were. Exactly. Um, one of my great mentors is a classmate of mine, and he had been hunting and fishing and trapping for years before I got started. And he now has a, a top-notch guide service in Jones, Louisiana. His name is Jack Luck. And, um, yeah, he taught me all kinds of stuff. We waded around in those swamps and, and burned up a lot of calories. <laughs> That's good. We could probably all use that, a little bit more of that these days. <laughs> yeah, huh? I, I sure can. <laughs> for sure, but, for sure. Okay, so then tell me the story. Um, how did you uh, – what, what, what happened next? Well, you know – you, you move forward in life, and there's a point where everybody starts going their own circle. My, my method of getting out of the nest and, and seeing the world was I decided I'm going to drive until I run out of money. 
And so I hit the road and ended up in Kenner, Washington with about $27 left of my name. 27 bucks. What year was That's this? It, bro. 79. Yep, and on the way, I spent three or four days in Yellowstone Park, and, and I had always seen pictures in the regulation book, you know, these diagrams, so you learn how to tell what the birds are yep. of a harlequin. And I'm thinking, coming from North Louisiana, there's no such bird in the world that looks like that. An idiot's drawing this and putting it in a book. Well, guess what I saw in Yellowstone Park? Harlequins. You saw harlequins there, huh? Yeah. And they nest in the mountain rivers and then fly west to the to the Pacific in the fall. And so, by golly, they do exist. And that's been my number one bucket list bird ever since. And so I'm since out here. 1979. Yeah. Still haven't got one. I, I had three opportunities last year, but the drake was always too close to a hen, so I didn't shoot. Because you guys only get, you, I think you were telling me, is it, it's one harlequin a year. Yeah. Here in Washington, the limit is one a year. Uh, other than Alaska, Washington's the only state in the country where you can legally shoot harlequin on a designated limit. I think it might be legal in other states as an incidental, you know, vagrant type of situation. Yeah. You can only target legally harlequins here in Washington and Alaska. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's, I think that's a lot, a lot on, on a lot of people's bucket lists. So yeah, it is. It really is. And they're awesome little birds. Awesome. So that's pretty much how I got up here. And I've spent most of the last 40, 30 plus years here in the West and the North and, and, uh, Gosh, there's just so much variety up here of everything you want to do. Yeah. Now, I know that um, I've talked to a, a, one of my buddies. He was up there, and uh, he said that, um, you know, you guys get some good shooting early on in the season, but uh, kind of, at least for puddle ducks on the on the backside there, it kind of dies off um, as they move through cause just with the weather and whatnot. And I've been looking at some Facebook pictures, and I don't know if I believe this guy anymore. Well, it's probably like pretty much everywhere else. Here in the west and the north, you know, you've got resident birds that nest here. And your first week or two of the season, you're going to slam the heck out of them. Uh, but once they're shot up, you pretty much have to wait till the migrations start coming in. And, then, and that's the doldrums of the season that uh, your buddy's talking about. And yeah. Having hunted the east side of the state for many, many, many years over in the Columbia Basin, that's that's what happens. You get a heck of a good opening weekend, everybody gets their limits, and then it tapers off very quickly from there until about the middle of November. Yeah. I mean, that sounds about right. Um, so, unless you want to target divers, correct? There's resident divers over there also. Uh, and again, they start showing up the first week, but really start coming down the second week of November. Uh, the Columbia and Snake Rivers, my gosh, the, the divers that come down those two rivers, just phenomenal. I've seen flocks of thousands and thousands of canvasbacks and redheads on the Columbia. Man. Just, and the golden eyes that migrate up the Snake River. If you're there when the migration's going up, it, it's it's a once in a lifetime event for most people to see that. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I, I don't even think I've ever seen a golden eye in person. So, well, we need to take care of that issue, don't we? Yeah, you know, my buddy Matt from High Prairie Sportsman, uh, he runs a little YouTube channel over there. Uh, he he actually shoots shoots them quite a bit in Nebraska. Um, really? Yeah, but. Uh, I know that he's got several videos up of hitting on them. So, but uh, another interesting aspect to you. So you are a, an, a you know a hunter of all four uh, flyways. You designed your own choke tube. You hunt sasquatches, and <laughs> um, you also carve your own decoys. I do. Yes, and and I haven't as much lately as I used. 
in the 90s and, and 2010s. Uh, but every decoy I use when I'm out on my own is my own hand carved decoys. So um, when was the first, when, what year did you carve your first decoy? Oh my gosh, that was 1991 or 92. We had had such a phenomenal season. Our, our limit those few years was four birds, three mallards and an odd duck. And we were getting our limits literally within 30 or 45 minutes every stinking day we went and i had a work schedule that let me let me hunt three or four or five days a week with that fast of an action so when the season was over i went into a, a real cloudy funk i mean i was in, in depression and i read something about some guy hunting over his own hand carved decoys in a magazine and i said that's it that's what i'm going to do in my first decoy was a, a drake uh hooded merganser which i still have and i went from there uh i've competed won one two or three contests won a state contest here one year um but I, i've taken it from decoratives all the way down now to what i call decorative gunning decoys yeah gunning de- decorative gunning decoys yeah <laughs> yeah I, I just don't put a head on it, throw some paint, and call it good. I, I'll put in detail on some, on most of them yeah. a little bit. Oh, I, I it's the I think that's the coolest thing to hunt over something that you made yourself. Um, now, uh, if I wanted to start up decoy carving and whatnot, um, I would probably uh, have to turn my marriage certificate in, but um, <laughs> yeah, just <you> with, <laughs> just with all the other things. Um, <laughs> But, uh, you know, the other thing, too, is is people, you know, I, I feel like a lot more people that do um, carving and hunt over their own decoys, it always seems to be you crazy diver hunters. And what's, what's that? It, it always seems to be that you crazy diver hunters that are always hunting over your own uh, your own decoys. So I, I think you guys have to be the craziest duck hunters out there, you know? Well, I... I... Didn't turn straight diver hunting until I moved over here on the west side of the state. I, I lived on the Columbia in the basin over there for 20 years. And here's a secret most people don't know about. I won't accept, but you don't need mallard decoys to bring in mallards and pintails. Throw out a bunch of teal decoys and you can get just as many birds of any species as you can with big giant mallard decoys. And, uh, to prove it, I had an old friend who filmed over the course of about 400 honkers coming into his teal decoys. Honkers on his teal? Yep, coming into teal decoys. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, it's funny today, literally just today. So people always people ask me and they say, oh, hey, do you use teal decoys for, for teal season? And I said, no, not really. I just use my mallard decoys because that's what I've got. Yeah. And... They're bigger, and the teal don't care at all. Um, no, they don't. And uh, but so kind of the reverse of what what I was saying there now is you're saying that you throw a bunch of teal decoy out, and is that just a confidence thing for them that not a lot of people are hunting big teal spreads, or or what do you think it is? Well, I, I you know all the big guys, all the writers, everybody says hunt the X. Right. If you know your area, you know where the birds prefer to be. Yeah. Put your decoys there. Yeah. They're going to be coming this way. You can throw some oh, mountain. You can throw some Mountain Dew bottles out there with some weights on them, and if you're on the X, oh you'd be a good me and guy. Johnny went down in Louisiana. Me and Johnny down in Louisiana killed a ton of ducks over painted milk jugs and, and Coke bottles. Oh yeah, I'm thinking I'm so, fixing to do that once this this year, but we'll see. This old guy that got me started on teal decoys actually uses those for divers also. He paints them black and white, and he can throw out five or six dozen teal decoys and pick them up and pack them out much easier than anybody else with three or four dozen regular-sized divers. Sure. Sure. Makes sense. And he, he just he killed as many or more than anybody else ever did. Yeah, and you know the thing, too, about it is, is some people just – you know that's all good and well, um, but there's some people that just really like their gear. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. They they like oh, yeah. 
they like to have these like super carved like really great looking decoys and for anybody that you know would say wow you know like there's always going to be people that say you can kill birds over you know coke bottles and and milk and you can and you can and the other people though like if you're going out there and you only go out once a week and you want to leave nothing to chance so you just uh (laughs) you yeah that it's a confidence thing you know that's 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 right what it comes down to look good feel good play good you know and it is what people want to experience. If if you want to experience your dream hunt every day with your own gear, go for it, man. Whatever it takes. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, so what do you, like, so you said you've been carving them since 1991. Yeah. Um, how many have you carved over that time? What's the, you know? How long does it take you? Do you do them in batches? Do you do one at a time? You know, tell me a little bit about that. I, I'll get a all of my gunning decoys now are made out of high density cork, and I'll, I'll get a a sheet of that and and turn out anywhere from six to ten, depending on the species, out of each sheet or block of cork. And yeah, I'll, I'll do all the bodies, then I'll carve the heads, then I'll, I try to do them in a workmanlike manner. Sure. But if I, if I'm just, I'm just killing time, or I want to turn out something very special for an individual or a client or whatever, I'll do one or two at a time. Uh, if I'm carving something for a banquet as a donation bird, I'm definitely going to put more into that one individual bird than I would a dozen gunners. Yeah, uh, sure, sure. Now you, uh, you, I, I can't remember if you told me it was Ducks Unlimited or Delta that you are up there with. I, I'm a member of the D, the Ducks Unlimited chapter here in Kitsap County. Okay. I'm on their committee. And now, when is your guys's just because you know I've got a couple buddies that are up in the area, and and I know we've got listeners up there um, for, for sure, um, unless you're just downloading a bunch of times. Uh, the podcast um but uh what's the uh when's your guys's event we have one coming up uh september 29th the last friday of september and it will be held i believe at the belmont inn here in in bremerton washington okay awesome awesome about how many people do you guys normally have coming to your uh your du banquet Around a hundred, usually. Oh, that's pretty good. That's a pretty good turnout. It is. It's a pretty good uh, turnout. We have a very active chapter, and, and uh, actually, we've held one of the uh, Ducks Unlimited uh, fun shoots. Hunter, what do they call them? Hunter, Hunter class fun shoots. Yeah, I believe so. Year. And you know, they just don't give those out to any any chapter you have to earn it and we've we've worked our butts off to earn the designation of being able to to, to hold that yeah I, oh absolutely um i know that they have one down and we have a really active du um club my buddy wade skeen he actually runs one down in derby and uh, they're doing that as we're recording here today on sunday what is it sunday the 26th um yes yeah, they're uh, they're probably out there shooting right now, doing their giveaway. So good for them. Yeah, yeah. That's one thing that is. Gosh, I'm I'm really excited to get out to some banquets. I told my wife, I said, "Hey, you know, usually I go out to these banquets by myself. This year, we're getting a babysitter. You're coming with me, <laughs> and you're going to enjoy yourself." And uh, good yeah, so we're, we're I'm looking forward to the banquet season coming up. So, so you, are you going to try to hit up very many? Oh, I think I got, two, I got two for sure. I know that I'm going to right now. Um, one's up in Nebraska, and one's actually a local one here in uh, Manhattan. So, um, yeah, I am. I'm just really looking forward to it, and want to try to. Um, you know, when I got into this, I was like, oh, hey, I'm going to get into the, you know, helping out on a, a DU chapter and all this other stuff, but. Uh, the podcast, you know, become it's almost a full time job outside of um, um, outside of my regular full time job with sure. the recording and the editing, and then what a lot of people don't know is is um, there's a lot of time that gets eaten up by 
uh, by Facebook and Instagram, and there's always the pressure to, um, you know, get out on the next platform and, you know, really try to, like, you know, uh, expand uh, where you're at and the content that you're putting out there. And uh, everyone thinks, oh, it takes 20 seconds to post a Facebook post. Well, oh, man, if I I did, I did not, that's not the case. <laughs> so. Yep. That's not the case, especially. And then I got a four-month-old, too, so. Oh, she keeps you busy. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. That's the whole reason I switched over to this um, kind of this field recording um, setup that I have now is because I used to, when I had to record, I had to be at home in the basement um, huh. doing it off the, the laptop. And But now I'm literally talking to you. I'm out in my truck, um, and I'm actually, you know, my wife thinks I'm just recording, but I'm really out uh, recording, talking to you, and uh, checking on a couple of my uh, permissions that I got last weekend. So, yeah, I, I hope those turn out real well for you. Yeah, I actually recorded the the whole uh, process of me going getting the permission and whatnot, and um, obviously didn't didn't record the conversations I had with the landowners because I feel like I probably wouldn't have any permission if I had done that. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, they might, might be a little intimidated by that. Yeah. So tell me about your typical morning when you go out and hunt. So like you decide you're going to go out and hunt on Saturday morning. What is, you know, tell me a little bit about what that looks like. Well, over here on hunting sea ducks, we're hunting on the hood canal yep. and, um, Mostly it depends on the, the tides, what time they're coming in, going out. Uh, on slack tides, you don't get a whole lot of action, but when the tide is changing, that's when the birds are moving. And so we want to be set up before it starts to turn. So and like when the tide is coming in or the tide is going out? Either way, either way. Okay. Uh, the birds are adjusting to the change in depth and, and, where they can get to food easiest because of that depth. Right. And so that's when we want to be set up and ready to go. Uh, you know, if the tide is going to turn at, at 9 in the morning or 8 in the morning, we're going to be out there at 6 getting ready. But if it's not going to turn until 11 or 12, why well, get up? We're not, we know we're not going to get any great shooting. So it's, it's a lot more laid back than, the, than hunting the public puddle duck areas. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's one consideration. You know, I, I've never really thought of because I I don't hunt divers and I don't live near the sea. I'm a uh, I'm a no coast kind of gentleman, and um, well, we can solve that issue too one day. <laughs> well, I, I'd actually love to do that. I have some family that lives up there, and so maybe next time I go visit them, I'll crawl on that boat of yours. All right, but for um, sure. but hunting. When we were over in the Columbia Basin, the public areas, anywhere along the river, once you get to the shorelines, basically a core of engineer property, it's all public property. And, of course, there's going to be certain spots, remote areas. And the guys that hunted hard and hardcore and religiously, everybody knows those. So if you want the best spots on a given day, you had to be there at 2 in the morning sometimes to get it. Oh, yeah. And that'll wear you down now. Oh, I know. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> uh, yeah. It, and now that, you know, this will be my first season. Last season, my wife was pregnant, and I felt a little bit of the pressure then because it's like, oh, hey, don't be further than 45 minutes away in case – something happens yeah. but now with the kid it's it's even i i'm, I'm assuming it's going to be a little worse because well one you know she's just a sweet cute little baby and so it's like oh like you don't get to wake up and have the little saturday morning that it are that is really nice and you know right but um at the same time man like i might be changing a diaper at midnight and then waking up at two to go beat some college kid to a public spot <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's what it takes, man. <laughs> He's out there pre-gaming it, and I'm just sitting there, you know, trying to 
trying to change a diaper and get all my decoys thrown in the back of the truck and link up with my other buddy who he's doing the same damn you know dang thing and we're just trying to <laughs> coordinate you know diaper and baby schedules to shoot some ducks but uh but you know what in another four or five years you'll have her tagging along with you on afternoon hunts and she'll take that red rider bb gun that's right <laughs> And you two will go out there and have one heck of a day, even if you only shoot one coot. Yeah, that's right. In about 16 years, she'll be out there holding my spot for me while I'm sleeping in. That's it. That's it, man. <laughs> Absolutely. Hey, you want to do what I do with my kids. I, I, when they were old enough to know what was going on, I'd hey, you want to go elephant hunting this afternoon? Yeah, go on, let's go. <laughs> so we'd go out, out in the fields. They're around the Blue Mountains in, in southeast Washington, and we, we were elephant hunting. Never found one, but we were out there hunting for them. <laughs> That's good. I might have to might have to try that one out. That's very interesting. But, all right. Well, hey, Kent, why don't you let everybody know where they can find, uh, find you and find your product. Um, and, you know, what exactly you need to get going. Um to try to get some of, more of these choke tubes out. Well, um, our website is down. We're, we're bringing that back up to speed. But if you want to reach me, you can uh, find me on Facebook, Kevin Ware. Uh, my phone number is 360-271-2836. Give me a call. Tell me what model gun you've got, and, and we'll match you up as best we can with a tube. Uh, we're just trying to get models on the market right now. And by that, I mean... We're just trying to cover our costs and, and get shipping paid for 50 bucks to your door. And it doesn't matter what model it is. Uh, I'm on the West Coast. My partner is in Louisiana. His name is Dustin Roberts. His phone number is 337-351-6005. And he's on Facebook also. Uh, contact either one of us. Uh, we'll talk with you. We'll go over what the pros and cons are uh match you up again we're trying to target primarily remington and mossberg barrels but yep. we do have some inventory of, of the other benelli and uh browning those winchester maybe uh, when we run out of our inventory if people still want to get on the waiting list absolutely we'll talk with you and, and get you set up same price fifty dollars to your door and uh, we'll get our Facebook page up and the website going here pretty shortly. And now the name of your guys' company is called? Wide Angle Shooting Systems. Wide Angle Shooting Systems. Because birds don't fly in circles, man. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I wish I had one for teals. Well, I guess I had a particular um, spot where I was dove hunting um, down in New Mexico. And yeah. the only... I had a very narrow window of where I could shoot the birds and they would zoom past and I'd, I'd have about literally that, that much, uh, time to identify, pull the trigger and hope that it would, you know, <laughs> connect. Right. I, I feel like yeah. if I would have had, uh, one of them wide angle, I, that was about the, one of the, one of the scenarios I, I find that I think that it could have been really, really, really helpful. Absolutely. They would be phenomenal with dove shoots. Oh, yeah. So, And I'm actually, right now, as we're talking, I'm sitting in a spot where I hope to get a couple of bantail pigeons uh, in another couple of weeks out here. That's a, a wild pigeon we have out here in the northwest, and you can shoot two of those a day. So I'm, I'm watching them fly around even as we're talking. Oh, excellent. Excellent. And now, are you still on the hunt for this bear right now? I'm still in the field sitting here. I'm, I'm about a quarter mile from, from where I was this morning out on, on a power line. But, yeah, I'm still out here. Okay. Well, if you see that bear, I want to I wanna see a picture. And then um, if, you, if you find Sasquatch, uh, let, him, let him know we said what's up. And uh, <laughs> As best I can, I'll say that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, go ahead, guys. Hey, check out Kevin. He's um, – He's in the the group, and so you can hit him up there. Uh, if you're up in the Northwest and you want to go to a good uh, Ducks Unlimited uh, banquet, hit him up. He'll get you the information. And uh, additionally, 
um, check out these wide angle um, shooting solutions that he has because I think this is going to be I, it's it's different. You know, you don't hear a lot of that stuff, and uh, that's the kind of stuff we're looking for. And uh, revolutionizing the industry, new products that are, you know, not just knockoffs of other products or anything like that. And this is kind of what uh, what it's all about. Yeah, I appreciate your time, brother. Yeah, absolutely. Well, hey, you stay safe out there, and uh, good luck, good hunting, and keep us updated. And uh, as soon as we get this this uh put out uh go ahead we'll send a link and for sure let everybody know uh about the the ducks unlimited banquet absolutely i'll, I'll stay in touch and, and send that picture as soon as i get him uh and again thank you so much for the time to talk about my products and and uh i look forward to hearing more from you guys and, and meeting you up in the field in the near future absolutely same to you like i said stay safe kevin all right sir all take right. care yep bye all right, and to finish up here, I want to talk a little bit about some of our partners that we've got uh, on the show. Um, you know, first we've got Hunt Hickory Creek. So Chase uh, over at Hunt Hickory Creek, they're doing something pretty cool, especially with this veteran giveaway. Um, and we've also got the uh, Fowl Front Hunt, which is on the uh, the first weekend there in December. Uh, so we're really excited about that, and we're going to be hoping to make that a uh, oh uh, an annual thing. So. Uh, we can definitely look forward to hearing a little bit more, you know, from uh, them as the season progresses. And don't forget, if you're, you know, thinking about um, spending money on a guided hunt somewhere out of state, um, especially in Kansas, get on over here, um, talk to Chase, talk to Cody, talk to Scotty, uh, and you can, you know, basically get to check out a guide service for for free um, and make an informed decision instead of just some some guy off the internet um, or some, you know, somebody kind of told you something about this, you can, you know, get in there and you can really get to know them and they're really good dudes and um, they have a lot of really cool stuff coming up. So uh, go check out Hunt Hickory Creek if you're looking to get on an excellent waterfowl hunt um, anywhere around central Kansas. We've also got Dive Bomb Industries and Dive Bomb Industries has given us 10% off uh, with the foul front code. So if you're looking to get into an affordable um, extremely realistic and really easy to set up spread um, and basically want to add some numbers and be able to compete with like guys like uh, like outfitters or the dude next next door who's throwing out you know 20 dozen go uh, go check out if you're go check out silhouettes because and uh, go check out dive bomb decoy silhouettes so uh, these things are they're legit um <laughs> And it's a really good way to build numbers fast and to compete. So, uh, plus they're a really cool, really cool company, and they got a lot of cool stuff coming out um, in the next, um, you know, several months. And then, you know, I've gotten a little bit of a, you know, look. (laughs) I've been just through talking with Asher and um, Cody, and like they have some really cool stuff and plans for the future. So. Um, and once again, one, kind of the common tenant here of all these partners is that they're all really cool people and really interesting, um, companies. So yeah, really looking forward to seeing what they've got coming out and, you know, uh, give them a shot because it takes about a minute to set out a dozen of these things and they take up zero space in the garage or truck. So go check out dive bomb industries. Uh, we've also got Toe Tags LLC. Now, Toe Tags LLC is a company. They're based out of Kansas, and um, well, you just heard their story. It's uh, you know a caution, uh, a cautionary tale, a uh, tale of you know a lot of heartache, and hopefully we can help you avoid any of that situation um, with Toe Tags LLC. I used them this weekend, and they're super easy to use. And uh, you know, you might think it's a hassle. And all that stuff, but just the confidence of walking out of the field, knowing that a game warden can't touch you because, you know, you are literally following the letter of the law. It, it feels pretty good, you know, and it, it was really convenient too because I just slipped it in the the bag, uh, and threw it in the the freezer, and it's good to go. I know that I've got four teal there instead of, <laughs> you know, 
Well, I mean, obviously you can tell teal, but it's nice to know what you've got in each bag. All right, we've also got Athlon Optics, and this might be some of the first time you're hearing about Athlon Optics, but they produce some really good shooting scopes. But I reached out to them um, because they produce really awesome binoculars. And I'm telling you, I've looked, uh, I, I've looked through these Athlons, and I've got a pair in my truck right now, and you can see so much better. I, I pulled up, I won't name the brand that my dad has, but we're looking out, you know, through his, and then I pulled mine up, and um, (laughs) it's a clear, clear difference, Um, and not to mention, any company that is willing to go out there and say, hey, here's a lifetime guarantee, lifetime warranty, you know, it's good to know that you can have your, um, your binoculars and use them instead of having to, like, keep them in an egg carton or something in the back of your, in your backpack, or it's good to know to just go out there with confidence that if uh, something happens to them, there's a, there's a company that's going to stand behind them. So yeah. So go check those out. That's Athlon Optics. They're also a Kansas company. And uh, if you give Athlon Optics a quick Google search, you're going to find that this is not some small time thing going on here. They, uh, they're in like, they're in most of the top fives, um, for as far as glass and and they uh, they're producing um, you know binoculars that are they're producing and selling them at a point that they 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 I don't know how they sustain it but these things are definitely worth three or four times um, what you'd be paying for them so that's definitely another consideration to think about so go go ahead and check on uh, Athlon Optics and uh, tell them we sent you over there. And uh, you know what? We're going to be doing um, a couple giveaways um, that they've they've sent us over some binoculars. And instead of just keeping them in my blind bag, I'm going to try to put them into yours. So keep forward, uh, look you know, look forward to that. Uh, we've also got Freelance Hunt Stats. Uh, that's um, obviously Elliot from over there at Freelance uh, Duck Hunter. Um, he is got this awesome um, entrance system where you can basically plug in all of your uh, data instead of just keeping a journal uh, of kind of what you did you this thing actually it's a journal but you can go back and you can analyze it and you can use the analytics and you can break stuff down it's pretty cool um, it, and it's I mean for the just give up a, a one Starbucks or give up you know one monster a month and you'll be you'll you'll be in uh, in like Flint so Go ahead and check that out, and then you can improve on your future hunting successes and basically get to go back and look fondly on, on all these things. On all of the, That's one of the things that I like about my hunting journals, and what I'm really excited for for this thing is because now I can go back and be like, oh, yeah, you remember that? Yeah, that's, that's cool. So, yep, go check them out. We've also got, uh, we got duck nuts. Um, duck nuts, you know, I hadn't used them in the field until this weekend. They, they're amazing products. Um, you can literally just, you, to throw it on there, you just do a quick tie and then all you got to do is just grab the decoy in one hand, the loop in the other, stretch it across and the, the duck nut (laughs) slides either down to the, um, to the bottom where you can then throw it out or it slides back up to the, you know, the keel and then you just throw it into a bag and you don't have to worry about things getting wrapped up because it's the, the weight part is sitting right next to the, uh, the decoy. And so you throw them all in a bag and all you got to do is grab plastic and then the freaking line just follows it out. So instead of like a Texas rig where you have to like make sure you're not crossing lines or, or shoving anything down in there and you got a big old mess when you just throw it down, this thing you just throw it in a bag and grab a decoy, toss it out. It's, it's pretty dang simple. Um, so yeah, go check them out. They also got uh, 10% off uh, if you use the code FOULFRONT. Um, on their site. So head on over to ducknuts.com. That's D-U-K-N-U-T-Z. Then there's uh, Gypsum Creek Retrievers. Evan down there is running a full-service gun dog training facility uh, right in the middle of Kansas. And we look, I look forward to heading down there. I'm actually in a couple weeks here, two weeks. I'm heading down there and we're going to we're gonna go hunt it up and uh, get, get on some teal. And he's going to show me kind of some of his methods and some of his dogs that he's training right now. And I'm really looking forward to it. We're going to do an episode um, basically on, you know, tuning up dogs and kind of what 
his program is all about. Um, it's not like most of the programs out there, but it's got some similarities with some of the, the really more successful um, dog trainers out there. So, yeah. Uh, and then we've also got, if you are trying to figure out how to learn to call, or even if you just want to make sure that you're all tuned up, there's some, there's some good programs out there uh, for you, but I'm going to recommend Duck Tech app. Um, so if you go down into the Google store and you Duck Tech, um, Duck Tech mobile app, download this thing. Um, and it's got, uh, Barney Califf on there, who is a, you know, three time world champion duck caller. And he teaches you the elements, the basic elements of, um, your duck calling and kind of tells you, you know, what they mean and when to hit them and all that stuff. I looked through it and it's pretty cool. The coolest feature about it is, is you can hear it, you know, it goes, wah, wah, wah. And then you can make the sound. Wah, wah, wah. It'll record you, and then it'll play it over that. So you can say, okay, this is what they sound like. This is what I sound like. Oh, okay, dang. Okay, delete that recording, and then hit it again. And so that you can kind of um, compare and evaluate yourself. And I think that's an extremely useful function. Um, yeah. And then we've, uh, last but not least, we've got SRB field rests. And these things are cool too. There's it. They're also a local Kansas company. In fact, the, where he gets them manufactured and molded, um, is I am, you know, I'm up here at my parents' house and I'm looking South and, and, you know, in Nebraska, you can just about see 20 miles and, uh, you can almost see it. So, um, yeah. And anyways, it, these things are pretty cool. Instead of laying your expensive shotgun in the mud, you just stick this thing in the mud or the ground and, uh, it props it right there, and they've got they've got stands for uh, all sorts of stuff. They got crossbows, shotguns, rifles, and uh, you know whether you're in a dry field or a muddy field, or if you're in a marsh, you know the flooded fields or the flooded timber, he's got something for you. So um, head on over to srbfieldrest.com and enter the code uh, Foul Front for a ten percent discount store wide. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of the Foul Front Waterfowl Podcast. Please come join us on our Facebook group, the Foul Front Waterfowl Podcast Group, where you can connect with a good group of hunters because we're all in this together. We need to act like it so that hopefully our great, great grandkids will be hunting ducks over our favorite public lands. Uh, We also ask that you go ahead and give us a written review on iTunes and give us five stars if you think we deserve it. And we really do want to hear back from you uh, so that we can give you the best possible content. And if you get in on that Facebook group, you can get in there and you can ask questions and you can tell us what you want to hear next or you can tell us uh, what you don't like and we'll be sure to tailor things to our listeners. So, all right. Stay safe out there and we will see you next week.